Hello, this is Rebecca Renfro, and you are listening to Enigmatic Anomalies EA Radio. Thank you for joining us tonight. We'll be speaking with Karen Dolan, the host of Through the Keyhole. Karen is a well-known speaker traveling the UFO circuit. She's been a guest at MUFON events, Starworks USA, and the UFO Crash Retrieval Conference. She's also served on the board of directors for the UFO Congress. Stay tuned. Karen will join us after this short break. For hundreds of years, those that have been curious enough to look to the stars in search of something beyond ourselves have been shunned, persecuted, and laughed at. Now, it's time for those curious few to laugh back. Saucer Seekers is a hilarious online comic strip that takes a humorous look at our world of disinformation while facing everyday life from the point of view of those who devote their lives to the search for the truth. The Saucer Seekers! TheSaucerSeekers.com my name is Michael the Fourth, and I'm the lead investigator for the Seekers Paranormal Society. About seven years ago, I had my first paranormal experience. Now, armed with the latest in paranormal equipment, I'm setting out to find the truth. Joining me on my quest to capture evidence is my equipment tech, Ramon Beavis, and investigator Steve Welch. Take a front seat into our paranormal world as we are driven into the unknown. We are Seekers Paranormal Society. SeekersParanormal.com Good evening and welcome to Enigmatic Anomalies. We're so glad that you could join us tonight. We've got an amazing guest with us. I'm Terry Ling and I'll be your host tonight and we'll be talking to Karen Dolan. And Karen, I, I know you're on the line with us. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, Terry. Thank you so much for asking me to be on the show with you. Oh, this is just totally our pleasure. We are so grateful that you were able to uh, be on the show with us tonight. So our listeners are probably wondering, who is Karen Dolan? And I know you've had a huge journey that you've been a part of for the last year or so. I also know that you've been doing a uh, radio broadcast similar to Enigmatic Anomalies. It's called Through the Keyhole. Right. Talk to me a little bit about that. What's going on with you? Well, I started... Um, hosting through the keyhole actually in 2007 and I am on a bit of a hiatus from that right now but I hosted that show from 2007 pretty much right through 2012 so I did five solid years of it and um, I'm not ruling out getting back on the air you know I've talked with my producer a few times about finding a time slot just working through some personal things over the past year I needed to take a break from it and um, kind of regroup and decide what I'm doing here um, gosh, where to begin? Through the Keyhole was originally about UFO-related material and also paranormal topics. And I interviewed a lot of people who did research and wrote books and gave presentations on all of these different topics. One of the things that my producer, Joe Montaldo, told me was that I was one of the first people on the Paranormal Radio Network who covered both sides of that. He said at that time, which was, you know, the late 2000, around 2009, 2010, he said almost every other host focused on one or the other, and people really wouldn't touch the other topic with a 10-foot pole. Right. So I had a lot of fun with Through the Keyhole because I would just, I'd talk about any topic that interested me, and I'm interested in pretty much everything. <laughs> As I am. <laughs> yeah. See, I... You're like me. I mean, we look at these things, and to me, anything that's a mystery, anything that we don't really understand mm -hmm. is fascinating, and I want to find out more about it. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if that's UFOs or 
2012 or Atlantis or Ghosts or any of that, they're all fascinating. They really are. Yeah. Well, um, and, you know, I'm interested in finding out a little bit about you on the personal side. Um, I understand that you have had an experience with extraterrestrials, and yet you also have had paranormal things going on in your life. So let's talk about you. What start? Where do we start with all that? Did it start while you were young or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, the earliest, well, I've always been interested in paranormal topics. You know, I was always a big fan of reading ghost stories and things when I was a kid. Um, I didn't really have a lot of paranormal experiences in my childhood, although I was very much interested in this sort of thing. But um, when I was about 11, I had something odd happen to me that I really could not figure out for many years. And I asked a lot of people. I remember telling my friends about it when it happened. And later, when I started to meet people who researched the paranormal, and then even later than that, when I started to meet people who were involved in UFO research, it was like this stock thing. I would come out with, here's something that happened to me. What do you think this might be? And it turned out that people in the UFO field were the first ones who were able to kind of explain it. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, (laughs) I really believe that's what what it was. Um, I had a partial memory of waking up in the middle of the night. And I mean, it's not unusual to wake up during the night and roll over and go back to sleep. Um, But I woke up one night and I looked toward my bedroom doorway. Now, we always left the light on in the hall. So there was, that was all the light in the room was coming through the doorway. Mm -hmm. And I saw three figures with like three people were standing in the doorway. It was a, a very tall, narrow doorway. So I couldn't see three distinct bodies. It was as if they were all standing very close together. But I could see three distinct heads. Um, There didn't seem to be any hair. I couldn't see any faces. They were silhouetted by the light behind them. And they didn't move. They just stood. Mm. Um, I I looked at them, and I was really scared. I mean, it's 11 years old. And I was telling myself, I'm dreaming. Okay, this has to be a dream. And I'm going to close my eyes. And when I open my eyes, I'm going to be awake. I'm going to look at the door, and they won't be there. So I did. I squeezed my eyes shut really, really tight. And I'm thinking, wake up, wake up, wake up. And I looked at the doorway, and they were still there. And I did this probably, I don't know, five or six times. I just kept saying, okay, it didn't work yet. I'm still asleep. I must be dreaming. I have to be dreaming. Oh, wow. And I'd look again. And, you know, finally, I looked, and there was nothing there. Mm-hmm. And I thought, okay, well, that was... That was a really scary dream, okay? <laughs> but kind of trying to convince myself it was a dream, and I did eventually get back to sleep. And when I woke up in the morning, I thought, oh, my God, that was that was some dream last night. And I sat up in bed, and I looked at my arm, and there were three red marks on it, like pinpricks. And they formed an equilateral triangle. And I know any three marks, any three points will form a triangle of some kind. Right. But they're usually not you know, perfectly even and exactly the same distance from each other, and exactly lined up on the axis from your elbow to your wrist. Um, these were, they looked like they were very carefully placed. And I sat, I still remember, I was 11 years old when this happened, and I still remember sitting up in my bed for a good 10 minutes, just looking at this and trying to convince myself either that that had been there when I went to bed the night before, or that there was some some way I had gotten it during the night. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that I could explain it away somehow. Did you tell your mother about it or your dad? No, I didn't. Yeah, that's very I common, think, actually. <laughs> yeah, I I think that I kind of wanted to, but I didn't know how to bring it up. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was. I have a vague memory that it was a school day, so I went downstairs and it was like everybody's rushing around getting ready for work and school, and there just wasn't much of an opportunity, and I didn't know how to say it anyway, and, and I didn't want to bring it up if I only had a minute or two, so... Yeah, and then later, I mean, how do you talk about something like that? Exactly. How do you bring that up? And especially when you're doubting it. I hope there's some Mm -hmm. young listeners that are hearing your voice and your story tonight because they need to talk to their parents about oddities in the night and this type of thing. They they don't want to face these things alone, and yet we all did, you know? Right. We didn't want to tell anybody. Interesting. Yeah, they should they should talk to their parents, and mm-hmm. hopefully the parents will listen to them. It's hard because a lot of adults now have a hard time getting their mind around something like this, the fact that it could exist. Right. And so you want to talk to somebody who 
will accept the fact that you had an actual experience or will help you figure out whether you really did or whether it was a dream. Yes, because actually. Because truthfully, another thing that's different now from when you and I were kids is that all the stuff is in the media now. Right. I mean, it's, it's in pop culture. When I had that experience, I had never come across anything like that before. Mm-hmm. I hadn't heard about someone else doing it. As I started to read about UFO experiences and contact experiences, I discovered, you know, how common that was. Yes. There were so many elements of that that were so familiar. I just kept hearing it over and over and over. So now it's a little hard to go back. I mean, for anyone who has the experience now, it's out in books, it's in movies, it's all over the Internet. You know, it's harder to say. I can say I know I really had that because there was no other place for me to get that. Well, I certainly you know, I hope... have that memory because it really happened to me. Exactly. And I certainly hope that any women out there right now that are hearing this conversation will consider this if you have kids. You know, ask your kids questions, draw them out, find out what's going on with mm-hmm. them, because this is really quite common. <laughs> it happens to so many yeah. children, and they don't talk about it. They're uncomfortable. They don't know how to approach parents. So, yeah, it's a good point. Very good point. So obviously that changed your life. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it, I think at the very least, at, at around 11 years old, I really, it brought home to me the fact that there's more to the world than what people talk about during daylight, you know, and what, what everyone's willing to admit exists because you can touch it and you can move it and you can turn it on and off. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes things happen that you can't control and you can't explain. And, I mean, it can be a scary thing, but it can also be really fascinating. It can open up a curiosity about the whole world and the whole world, not just what we talk about in school. Right. I I was um, saying earlier, talking with someone, how... uh, We have to be retaught everything because what we were taught as kids isn't the reality that we are living in as adults. And so we're looking at everything and it's like, this isn't what I thought it was going to be because I wasn't told the truth or the whole truth. Okay. Right. Yeah. (laughs) It's something. Yeah. There's so much more to the world than we ever expected. Or, you know, we're taught to accept or to believe it. And there's so much more that we can do. I mean, I'm a huge fan of The Secret. And that's a pretty controversial thing. I've talked about that on the Internet and in some of my Facebook posts and things. And some people will say, oh, yeah, you're, you're really gullible. That's where you sit around on your couch and wish for things and you think they're going to happen. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. no, it's not exactly that. No, right? no not at all. But it's, it's knowing that there's more to the world than just the physical. And if you understand it and you know how to use it, you can add a little more oomph to your physical efforts. Very true. And, you know? Mm-hmm. This yeah, is all... and I, I think most of us have used it maybe sometimes without even realizing. Right. Yeah, I'm sure that we have. You know, I know I have. And I watched The mm-hmm. Secret, and I, I really liked that. I saw that years ago. And, yeah, it, it was very interesting. And, and that's still on the Internet today, so anybody can go to it. Just type it in, and it pops right up. Yeah. Well, we've got to take a real quick break. So um, let's hear a word from our sponsors, the UFOstore.com. We'll be right back. 4,734 UFO sightings in 2007. 854 abductions by aliens or unknown species reported by American and British citizens. Press information about collisions with passenger aircraft and UFOs that has been kept from the public knowledge for years. And only one trusted source on information from some of the top UFO researchers in the world. Exclusive information that cannot be found anywhere else on the planet. Trusted. Connected. Accurate. The UFOstore.com. Expand your personal library with fast shipping and instant downloadable information from the largest selection of UFO products on the internet by going to theufostore.com or call on the 24-hour, 7-day-a-week order line at 541-523-2630. The truth is out there, and theufostore.com has it.
Welcome back to Enigmatic Anomalies, EA Radio. And we're very proud to have Karen Dolan with us tonight. Hi, Karen. So Hi, be- Carrie. <laughs> before we left, um, we were talking about uh, just the things that have been going on in your life and some of the odd, strange, paranormal things. But I had uh, been wondering about your extraterrestrial involvement. And I know that you have had some type of um, experiences. Would you share that with us tonight? Sure. Um, actually, it all, it stems out of the experience I was talking about in the first segment. Um, I had a conscious memory of waking up during the night and seeing figures standing in my doorway. For years, that was all I remembered, and I knew something odd had happened, but I didn't know what. And, you know, I also had that mark on my arm when I woke up, so I, I felt like that was evidence that something had happened. It wasn't just a dream, but I couldn't figure it out. Um, I asked a lot of people over the years, you know, what they thought had happened, and never really got a definitive answer until many years later I was fortunate to meet Bud Hopkins when he came here to Rochester for a conference. Um, The MOFON International Symposium was held here in 2002 and I met him and I knew that he had worked with people who had had various contact experiences and by this time it was just sort of it was almost a habit. You know I'd tell people oh here's this little thing that happened to me. Does this sound familiar now? Do you have any ideas about what might have happened? Mm-hmm. And he kind of looked at me, and he looked like there was something he wanted to say, but he kind of didn't want to say it. And he sort of smiled, and he said, well, yeah, actually, um, it does sound like, you know, I might know what happened, but if it's not really bothering you, I don't think we should get into it. You know, it's fine. Mm-hmm. And I thought, okay. <laughs> I, I kind of pressed him a little bit. I said, well, you know, I know the kind of thing that you do and that you were presenting on here at this conference. I said, do you think that might be what happened? And he said, well... The way you've described it is sort of consistent with some of the things I've heard from other people. But again, he stressed that if I wasn't having problems every day because of it, he said, I don't think we should go there. He said, if you were having problems sleeping at night or if you were, you know, really obsessing about this or very upset about it all the time, then absolutely, I'd be happy to talk to you. But, you know, his attitude was very much don't stir up the pot if you don't have to, if there isn't a very good reason. Yeah, that's wise. So I kind of left it for a while, and it was about a year or so later, you know, it was beginning to really weigh on me because I was thinking about having talked to him. And I said, you know what, this is, it's starting to bother me. It's beginning to be a problem, and, you know, it could be talk. And he said, absolutely. Um, I met with him at his apartment in New York a couple of times, and I also talked with another member of the group that he had formed, the Intruders Foundation. And we we did, like, counseling sessions, and we did some regressive um, hypnotic sessions, which was really interesting for me because I didn't know anything about hypnotic regression before we did this. And I always, I always pictured, like, you know, it, the way uh, hypnotists are pictured in the movies, like these Las Vegas performers. And, Swinging pendulums. And it wasn't like that at all. <laughs> it was just I sat on my own couch and relaxed. And this person would ask me questions, and it was like remembering... I would just relax enough so that I could really remember what had happened. And I do know, I remember that he tried to ask me leading questions, and there were a few times when I said, no, it wasn't like that. It was like this. And at the time, I thought, how could you be so obtuse? Why do you keep asking me the wrong things? (laughs) And he explained later he did that because he wanted to be sure that I would contradict him, that I wasn't just saying what I thought he wanted me to say. Uh So I thought that was really interesting. You know, I I really um, trusted my own perceptions. Because as he walked me through what I remembered and then asked me, okay, so what else do you see? What else is there? More Uh and more detail came out. In my conscious memory, I didn't remember those figures ever coming into the room. They stopped at the doorway. In the memories, once I did the regression, I remembered looking down toward my feet, and there were were more than three. There were five or six figures kind of circling around my bed. And I remembered them leaving the room and actually going out through a window at the back of my house. And when I say through the min- the window, I mean actually physically passing through the glass. Not an open window. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Not an open window, like through the glass. Oh, boy. <laughs> and that was the thing. And I remember remembering that and thinking, in hypnosis, that's got to be wrong. That can't <laughs> possibly. I must be making that one up because that can't be right. And later... After the session was over and we were discussing what I had remembered, um, Jed Turnbull, who was the, the hypnotist at that time, 
told me to read a couple of particular books, and I can't remember now which ones they were, but they described, contactees described doing the same thing, passing right. through windows. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it was more effective than him just telling me, yeah, other people have said that. He actually showed me their accounts, and I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, I kept taking another step toward reality, and I'd have to keep stopping. It was all jerks and starts. I'd make progress, and then I'd have to stop and think, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. This is too much. This is too weird. This can't be real. I must be making this up. Mm-hmm. But then I'd be thinking, well, where did I make this up from? Where did I get this? You know, because here are all these other people who described exactly the same thing. So I don't think I was making it up. I and think- actually, um, when I remembered going out through that window, I was going out into my backyard, and there used to be, when I was a, a child, there was a field behind the house where I lived. Um, it's all been built up. It's got houses on it now. But I remembered actually going out to a structure in that field, and it was temporary. Like, I mean, I hesitate to say there was a spaceship landed in the field, but I think that's what it was. It was something that came here, and then it went away. Mm-hmm. And many years later, um, I got in touch with somebody. Someone came to me. And he was interested in UFO research, and he had moved here to the small town that I grew up in after I was no longer living in that town, but living nearby. And he said, I married a woman who has a daughter who went to school with you, and she had an odd experience where she saw, where she went outside in the middle of the night, and he went outside after her because he thought she was sleepwalking, and the two of them saw a bright light in the sky. And when he described where his house was and which direction he was looking, it was toward my house. Ah. So I think he actually, and it was about the same time. We never pinned down the actual date, but it was like the same month and the same year that I had my experience. So she might actually have had a contact experience the same time I did. Oh, wow. So that could have been a validation. Um, yeah. You know, earlier... I, it felt that way to me, and I just I thought, I mean, for me, that was like another step toward reality, and it was really scary. I had to put everything down for a little while again. Yeah, and, you know, um, that's what I was just getting ready to address. It's like, it's a process going through changes that are this profound. And even though it's controversial, you're trying to wrap your mind around it, and it's just mm-hmm. epic. It's... it's um more than what we can say is bizarre. So it's hard for us to accept it and believe what we actually even saw. I remember going through that a couple of times, and I've heard many people say that have uh, seen extraterrestrial crafts and um, aliens themselves that uh, they had to ask themselves over and over again after the event, did that happen to me? You know, and Mm -hmm. those people who uh, were not alone when it happened would talk to each other and go, do you remember that night? You know, and and they, Mm -hmm. oddly enough, don't talk about it. So this is why it's so odd and why it's so important, you know, that you're sharing all this for mothers out there and women to hear that you do need to talk to one another, your sisters, you need to talk to your brothers and your kids about this because it's probably happening a lot more than people realize. And people just yeah. aren't talking about it, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, it, and I didn't talk about it for a very long time. I just, I didn't know how to bring it up. Even after I realized that I wasn't the only person in the world having this experience. You know, skeptics say, oh, these people just want to tell the story. They just want attention. No. Um, my experience was I didn't want to talk about it. And I've had a lot of people come up to me at UFO conferences. I've attended a lot of conferences over the years. And I've had a lot of people come to me and take me aside and very quietly want to tell me their experience. And nine times out of ten, they want me to explain it away. They're not looking for me to confirm that they had an extraterrestrial contact. They they would rather I tell them that I think they have a mental illness. They'd rather be convinced that they need to see a psychiatrist because, it, you know, the the actual reality of this is too big to get your head around sometimes. And it's very scary to think that everything you grew up thinking about the world is wrong and is, you know, horribly incomplete. It is. And we have no concept of, of our real place in the world because we're leaving out everything that's not on Earth. 
Very true. I mean, it's, uh, it is hard, uh, for all of us to, even, even still, I, f- I find I'm on an uphill battle all the time when I'm sharing my own personal stories and I'm sharing it to people, not, not to do any broad brush stroking or anything, but I feel like I'm awake. They're asleep. I'm trying to shake them awake and say, look, You've got to wake up to hear what I'm saying. And otherwise, I'm just, it's just all falling on deaf ears. Because yeah. people did grow up with the misconception of what reality is. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to be honest, reality is kind of, we're, we're on our way to hell in a handbasket. And if we don't start waking up and dealing with reality as it actually is, not as some people would like to think it is. You know, we really are going to be in deeper trouble every year. Oh, yeah. I mean, look and at look at the world today. <laughs> I know. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's a huge mess. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so many of us just keep pretending, oh, everything's fine. <laughs> yeah. No, it's not. I mean, things are happening <laughs> that are big. And, and, you know, maybe they're not scary. Maybe they're not bad, but they're there and we need to be aware of them. You know, we're not the only people in the universe. No, there are other beings out there. They are coming here. They are contacting us, and we better wake up and answer. Yeah, I I do believe that the that they are here amongst us, and um, you know we interact with them, and I'm sure that they're here with us. I've Mm -hmm. seen them. I've seen the crafts, and um, it it's it's so sad that people that haven't had the experiences aren't able to relate. But you know, I can Mm -hmm. honestly say, had I not had my own personal experiences and seen with my own two eyes, even maybe I would have been a skeptic and an unbeliever. I think the most sad thing, though, is that people who haven't had the experience are not able to accept the evidence and the testimony of the thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, who have had this. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I used to say to people, it'd be like me saying, well, I've never been to China, I've never seen it, and I've never been there myself, so I don't believe it exists. Exactly. And I don't care how many other people have seen it, and I don't care how many people have been there and taken pictures. I haven't seen it, so I'm not going to believe it. Mm -hmm. I mean... How many people have to see UFOs before we accept the fact that they're out there? You know, and in any any court case, in any criminal case, we'd have more than enough evidence to convict. Absolutely. But, you know, if you, you get a good photo, somebody says, oh, that must be fake. Mm-hmm. It's too good. You get a bad photo and somebody says, well, that doesn't show anything. You have eyewitness testimony, sometimes multiple witnesses, frequently multiple witnesses. And they say, well, you know, it's mass hallucination. You get physical evidence, and people just refuse to mention it. I, <laughs> what exactly do people want? <laughs> well, disclosure, obviously, and we're working on yeah. that. And, you know, I, I do believe that the extraterrestrials are taking that in hand at this point and revealing themselves to us. And they're reaching out to to different ones through media, like the movies, um, Contact, and the different ones that we've seen lately that are all extraterrestrial related. I don't want to get into mentioning all the different names, but um, mm-hmm. Close Encounters, you know, different ones. And yeah, there are so many. There are, and I think that uh, it is kind of, disclosure is leaking out little by little on a one-to-one basis, which is a great way to do it, actually. Unfortunately, we have to go to a break at this moment again. I'm so very sorry, but um, please stay tuned uh, and hear a word from our sponsors, uh, Saucer Seekers. For hundreds of years, those that have been curious enough to look to the stars in search of something beyond ourselves have been shunned, persecuted, and laughed at. Now, it's time for those curious few to laugh back. Saucer Seekers is a hilarious online comic strip that takes a humorous look at our world of disinformation while facing everyday life from the point of view of those who devote their lives to the search for the truth. The Saucer Seekers! TheSaucerSeekers.com My name is Michael the Fourth, and I'm the lead investigator for the Seekers Paranormal Society. About seven years ago, I had my first paranormal experience. Now armed with the latest in paranormal equipment, I'm setting out to find the truth. Joining me on my quest to capture evidence is my equipment tech, Ramon Beavis, and investigator Steve Welton. Take a front seat into our paranormal world 
as we are driven into the unknown. We are the Seeker's Paranormal Society. SeekersParanormal.com Welcome back to EA Radio, the home of the enigmatic and the anomalous. And tonight we're talking with Karen Dolan, who was involved with Through the Keyhole, but is on a hiatus from that at this time. And we've been enjoying hearing your personal story, Karen. It's been great talking to you. If our Thank listeners you. would want to get in touch with you, what is the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, right now, probably the best way would be through my Facebook page. And, and you can find me on Facebook just as Karen Dolan. I don't have a fancy, funny name because I can never think of one. <laughs> um, but you do have to spell my name correctly. Karen is spelled K-A-R-Y-N. Okay. And you'll see a picture of me and my cat. Even if I change my profile picture, there's always a cat on there somewhere. So. <laughs> I love that cat. <laughs> I do, too. Thank you. <laughs> and when you see my page, you'll see lots of funny cat pictures because, you know, the world's kind of a dark place some days, and I think we all need a laugh. Yeah. I'm trying to do my part to, you know, raise everybody's spirituality and, you know, spread joy by posting funny cat pictures on my page. Aww. And Look, I think it works. It does work. <laughs> it makes me laugh, so I put them up. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> and do you have a website at all? I do have a website. Um, if anyone goes to it right now, it hasn't been updated in ages, but you're inspiring me to get over there and get it fixed. <laughs> um, and that's also just KarenDolan.com. Okay. Um, so I will get that updated. Those really are the best ways to get in touch with me. Okay. Um, yeah, it's amazing. You know, I am. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, I'm a, sorry. it's amazing well, uh, Facebook. Just... Oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to hear what you're saying about Facebook now. <laughs> well, I was just going to say it's 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 so amazing the networking we can do on Facebook and how many mm-hmm. people we can reach out to yeah. and be a part of their lives in a way that we don't even really realize. I it, know. It's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I've posted a few things on Facebook that um you know, just someone's having a tough day or a downtime or something, and I put something out, and it's amazing how immediately, within a few minutes, there will be all these people who I've never met. You know, maybe I've seen their names before. Maybe they're familiar just from Facebook. But they'll post things like, oh, it's okay, you can do it, hang in there, we trust you, you know, we believe in you. And everybody is just so wonderful. They all really just reach out and support each other, and it's really great. It is. It's so wonderful. And especially on those days when you're struggling to get through and, you know, things are just mm-hmm. piling up on you. I appreciate yeah, all of my Facebook friends. Yeah. Thank you, Facebook yeah. people. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> and I and love you know, the birthdays. Once in a while, and I have posted, you know, thank yous to people. And I've said there have been so many times when I've been having a tough day and I see something someone else says. And it just lifts my spirits. And I don't always think to say, thank you so much for posting that. So I said, everybody, just remember, you know, when you put something positive out there, you won't hear back from everyone whose life you touched. In fact, you won't hear back from most people. But just remember that, you know, for whatever, if three people get back to you, then you brighten 20 people's lives. So keep doing it. Keep putting this out there. Because people listen. We pay attention. And we, you know, we do get to be friends. And it's funny, people are like, oh, it's just on the computer. No, I mean, I've got people who I still have never met in person, but we talk. Um, I know we laugh at the same things. I know we, we're afraid of some of the same things. We share our concerns about the world. And, you know, we get each other through. I mean, and what is that if not a friend? And exactly. I don't care that I haven't met them face to face. Someday mm-hmm. I will. Mm-hmm. I feel the same way. And so, you know, huh. amen to that. I, I'm so grateful for for those people who are um, kind and encouraging. It is true. You you know, it's all yeah. about love. It's all about lifting each other up and supporting us. And I'm g- so grateful for the networking that happens there. Uh, and I like to see the pictures and the faces. You know, I really do like yeah. that. I think it's an amazing invention. Just amazing. It really is. Mm-hmm. And it's a great way to network events where you can get together and meet in person as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it is. Like the Star Wars conference that's coming up in May. I cannot wait for that. <laughs> it's going to be in Chicago in, what, the first weekend in May? It is. I think it's the second through the fourth, and Kevin and I will be there. 
and you'll be there. I can't wait to see I'm, you. And Yeah, absolutely. It's going I to be great. I am so looking forward to that. Paula's amazing. She's just amazing. She does such a good job with her um, symposiums. Yes, and it's, uh, for anyone listening who's not familiar with Paula Harris, she's an Italian journalist and investigative reporter. She's wonderful. Her books are fantastic. She has a real gift for getting to know people in the field as people, as individuals. They're not just. She's not just about the material, but really she's very, very good at making connections with people and bringing people together. Mm-hmm. And so it made total sense when I heard that she was starting a series of conferences because that's that's so exactly what she does. And they're all incredibly um, successful because she does such a good job with it all. And she's always got yeah. so much to say. <laughs> that is one yeah. amazing woman. Hats off to her. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and I really like that she started this off with a focus on giving women a voice in the field of UFO research as well, because it's true that I don't think anyone intends to make it a boys' club, but it really is. There's so many conferences where there aren't very many female speakers. That's so true. Well, not anymore, because she's had quite a few and is continuing to bring women into the spotlight. So, you know, I even I was on one of her panels, which... Um, was such an honor. It was just such an honor here in Sebring, Florida, mm-hmm. getting to know all the different people that came. It was very enlightening for me, very encouraging for me. Um, sometimes when you're someone who has had an experience, you feel odd, you know, because yeah. not everybody talks about it and <laughs> or or they think you're just weird because you've had it, <laughs> whatever. But it was right. very validating being there with her and um, sharing with others who were like-minded and had had experiences. So I didn't feel so different. You know, I actually mm-hmm. felt very much at home and accepted. Unfortunately, That's always been one of my favorite things about going to these conferences is just being surrounded by people who don't roll their eyes when you talk to them. Exactly. Oh, my gosh. How true is that? <laughs> you, and because you see soul, that tell you. <laughs> you see it everywhere else so it's so nice Absolutely, to be amongst yes. your own <laughs> yeah and it's hard you know because this is a huge thing in your life when you've had a, an experience like this you need to be able to talk about it and you need to be able to process it mm-hmm. and and there's so many times when you can't there's just no one around who is able to hear it yeah, like con- you just go to a connecting. conference, you can sit at a dinner table with a, eight or ten strangers and everybody's got their story. Mm-hmm. And they'll all listen. So mm-hmm. I actually come home from a UFO conference feeling like maybe I'm not crazy. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I go back to work and everybody there, of course, thinks I am crazy because I was just at a UFO conference. But hey. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> they should go and see what we do. We really don't stand around yes. with tinfoil hats on. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> Although well, you know, I'm starting funny, to wonder. Dick. I know. <laughs> Maybe well, we many should. Many years ago, I used to work retail, and I'd have to ask for weekends off so I could go to a UFO conference, and that was always a hoot. But then I remember talking to some of my, my customers who were, like, coming through my line as I'm ringing up their purchases, you know. And, and I'd start this when I saw somebody had a lot of stuff, so I knew I'd have time to talk. And I mentioned I was going to a UFO conference, and they'd be like, really? <laughs> what, what is that? What, what do you do at one of these? And I'd say, well, actually, I'm listening to uh, Stan Friedman, who's a, a nuclear physicist. And he's going to be doing a presentation on the possible propulsion methods of different UFOs, like if they are real, how would they get here? Mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe speculative, but there's a lot of physics in this, and it's really based on the science of it. And then I'd be talking about all these other people, and, you know, Bud Hopkins is working on, you know, discussing his research with the thousands of people who have all had similar experiences. Mm-hmm. And he always says, well, I don't know what experience they're having, but it's interesting that they're all reporting the same thing, and they don't know each other, and they're all over the world. And, you know, two or three of these, and pretty soon these people are saying, what, now where did you say this conference is? Exactly. And do uh-huh. they have a website, and how do I sign up for this? Yeah, it's not a bunch of so nuts. So that's always fun. <laughs> so. I know, it is. And, and you know, I work with people here within MUFON in the state of Florida, and they're, they have such impressive backgrounds. I'm actually very proud to be associated with these people. Um, you know, they are coming from physicists, and let's see, we've got uh, retired police, we have people from um, the FBI, we have NASA, we have yeah. so many varied backgrounds. And, you know, like you said, people think, oh, UFO people, they're these crazy people with the tinfoil hats. Uh, 
No, not really. Yeah. Actually, yeah. there's some of the there's greatest like minds. One guy named Bubba who's out in the woods and thinks he saw something. I'm like, yeah. no, actually. <laughs> How about a group of police officers in Ohio who chased a single UFO around five precincts? Exactly. And we have mm-hmm. recordings of them talking to each other on the radio and saying, it's coming towards you. Do you see it? Yes, I see it. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God, what is it? You know, <laughs> These are trained observers. If they don't know what it is, I think we can be forgiven for calling it unidentified. Exactly. Yeah, good point. Absolutely good point to make. But yeah, and and I will say that every time I have gone any anywhere to a symposium or anything like that, conferences, I learn so much. So to those oh, out God. there who are considering going, do it <laughs> because Oh, absolutely. It, it truly is yeah, worth your time and money. Mhm. Yeah. <laughs> well, absolutely get hooked and have to go to more because they are amazing. Yeah, they they truly well, are. And, it's not and about I come the t-shirt. Home with a suitcase full of books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's not about the t-shirt it's about the knowledge no <laughs> oh my gosh did you, you with people yeah exactly connecting with people now you so were you and i met at a conference i'm sorry no that's okay um yes we did no it's okay um you were working on a book have have you uh gotten to a place where you're ready to publish that yet not yet, but um, I'm pretty excited about it, actually. I'm I'm working on a book that's based on my work as a host of Through the Keyhole, and, you know, I've selected certain interviews from my show, and I'm writing them up so that, uh, like, a chapter is based on one interview. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not just a straight transcription. I'm actually, like, using that as a basis, but then writing about the person I spoke with and the subject of their research and what we talked about during the interview. Mm-hmm. And, Very uh, I'm good. I'm really, really excited about getting this out. When do you think it will make it? Um, I'm hoping within this year, okay. 2014. Um, I'm not sure because I'm I am turning out to be slower at transcribing the interviews to give myself something to work to start from than I had hoped. But I'm really, really having fun working on it. I'm I'm having a great time going back and listening to the old interviews again Aww. and remembering doing these interviews, because some of them go back to 2005. The very first interview I ever did, in fact, was with Ryan Buell, who at that time had started this little organization that later became the basis for the TV show Paranormal State. Mm -hmm. He was with the uh, Penn State Paranormal Research Society. Okay. And, you know, he turned into a fairly, a somewhat controversial figure, actually. There was a a big fuss once he got his TV show. Because, you know, once you you stick your head out and you become public, then some people don't like the way you do this, and some don't like how you do that. And, Mm -hmm. you know, anytime there's a TV show, there's people, there's a lot of buzz about it. Yeah. Uh And so for a year or two, his name was very big, and I was thinking, wow, you know, I talked to him when he was getting started. Mm-hmm. So that was pretty cool. That um, is I've very cool. I talked with cool. Giorgio Sukalos from Ancient Aliens a couple of times. I interviewed George Nori almost one of my first interviews. Ooh. And that was neat. That was a lot of fun. I bet. <laughs> Well, what we've covered hasn't even scratched the surface of everything that we've wanted to talk about tonight, but we're out of time. And I want to thank you so much just for coming on with us and being a part of what we're doing here at Enigmatic Anomalies Radio. I hope that uh, we see you soon and um, that we can get together again and do this. And if you ever do get... um, through the keyhole up and running again, uh, please let us know. We'd love to hear about that. Great. Well, thank you so much for asking me. I've had an absolute, just wonderful time talking with you tonight. Oh, thank you. And me I too. Really, I wish you every success with your programs. I just, I think this is fantastic. I'm so excited to be a part of this. Oh, thank you. We're enjoying it very much. Kevin is an amazing production um, producer, director, and we're also doing EA TV. So there's just a lot on our plates, but we're loving every minute of it, and we really feel called to it. So thank you. Great. Mm-hmm. It is so exciting. Well, have a good night. You too. Thank you, Terry. Okay. Good night. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs> 